morning. Um, Council approach for just a minute.
be seated. I give you a draft instruction. To the satisfactory, Judge. Okay, satisfactory to the state? It is, Your Honor. Council approach. Is all ready? All right, we're ready. Yes. All rise for the jurors, please. Please be seated. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I just have a preliminary matter I want to address with you. Uh, the court is aware that posters and other items related to this case have been placed in areas around the courthouse. I remind you that your verdict in this case must be based exclusively on the evidence that is presented in this case. That includes evidence presented during the trial and what you saw on the view. Just as you were instructed that you could not consider any television, newspaper, online, or other coverage of this case, you may not use or consider any information that may be posted or found outside the courthouse other than on the view in coming to your verdict. Uh, Attorney Smith, <clears throat> does the defense wish to present any evidence? No, Your Honor, the defense rests. 
All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the defense has now rested, so it is time for closing arguments. Uh, counsel, whenever you're ready. Wake up, baby girl. Baby girl, wake up. Those were the words that Ta Kayla used to describe how Adam approached his child when he discovered that she was dead. Kayla used words that were the truth sometimes to fill in her lies. Baby girl, wake up. Those words were from a real memory of how Adam was speaking when he discovered his daughter looking peacefully asleep would never wake up again. Wake up, baby girl. But she didn't. Those words were the truth surrounded by Kayla's lie. Adam is no innocent. Shortly after he discovered that his baby girl would not wake up again, he began a series of decisions, terrible and criminal decisions. He made them with a very misguided belief that he had to make them to keep his family from being ripped apart. And he made those decisions with the input and influence of his wife, Kayla. He did make those choices, and you will hold him accountable for those choices. He and Kayla hid, moved, lied, and manipulated Harmony's body after her death. It's unforgivable. They lied about her whereabouts after her death, and it's unforgivable. But he did not do this to hide that he killed Harmony, because he did not kill Harmony. He did this because he believed it would keep his family together. He did not witness tamper with Kayla. She was an instigator and equal partner. He did not influence her. She influenced him. And most importantly, he did not kill his daughter. He did not kill his baby girl. When Kayla was facing charges not related to Harmony's death, theft, and two charges of receiving stolen property, charges that, that could send her to prison for over a decade. And then, by her own actions, she was facing two more charges for perjury, for lying about Harmony's death, and she was subject to two more felonies. These felonies, three and a half to seven each, potential, stacked in prison. Three and a half to seven, plus three and a half to seven, plus receiving stolen property times two, plus theft. So Kayla decided to lie about Harmony's death, to accuse Adam of something that he did not do to get herself out of her own pro problems. And what better way than to pick an accusation that had already been made? Adam was already arrested and in jail for an allegation of striking Harmony, a tale that he had struck her and given her black eyes. That became the groundwork for Kayla's own lies. She had to lie because the truth would point to her. And her lies were accepted because Adam had already been accused of causing Kayla black eyes. Her lie was easily accepted until you look past the horror of what she has said and past the emotion that would be the reaction when you heard her say it. When you look with a critical eye at those lies, you're going to see that their lies intertwined with truth. Wake up, baby girl. The allegation that Adam beat his child for days and then on December 7th for hours is crazy. And I'm going to briefly go over that. 
and the craziness of it as it got worse and worse with the telling. She told you a horrific story of Adam screaming and yelling and beating Harmony because when they woke up to go to the clinic, she had peed in the car, screaming and yelling at the colonial village at an hour that people might be going to work for rush hour, at a time that they should not have been there and they were essentially squatting and not wanting to be noticed. Screaming and yelling and punching her in the head. And then they got to the methadone clinic, which was about 10 minutes away at around seven o'clock in the morning. Kayla got her dose at 7.04 when the clinic was open for people to get their doses. Her horrific story continued with Adam beating Harmony, she says, when he got out of the clinic, he at 7.09. She said he smelled urine and said, again, Harmony, why don't you tell us? And he began yelling and hitting her right in the head right there in front of the clinic. And you know that one time that they had done something wrong outside the clinic, they got told on. One time, she told you, they had left the kids in the car and gone into the clinic together with no one watching the kids, and they got told on. And they had to change their habit and go in one at a time so that somebody would always be out with the children that would have been noticed outside the clinic at 7 a.m. when people are going in for their doses. She continued that horrific tale because she said, after witnessing these beatings, she said, I'm hungry, let's go to Burger King. And Adam drove to Burger King and on the way, she said Harmony was crying a lot and making a weird noise. And Adam got really angry and kept punching, punching her and said, shut the fuck up. And then he hit her at the traffic lights. Two, maybe three traffic lights, she said, coming over the seat and pummeling her in the back not in secret, not hidden, broad daylight on a busy street with busy traffic stopped at a stoplight. And then she said, she put up an arm to stop him. She doesn't mention any effort to try and stop those horrific acts beforehand no effort on her part. But somehow or other at this point, she thinks this is enough and puts her arm up. And what does she say he does? He gives her a look, a crazy look, like evil. It's the first time she had seen that. And she felt like he might hit her. So she didn't do anything. She, she, he scared her, she said. And then as he's punching her, she says, driving into the Burger King parking lot, and you were there, wide open parking lot, says that he's punching her and says, I felt something different. I think I really hurt her this time. She said he was scared. So what does he do when he's scared? He drives up, he orders, the food that Kayla wanted. She was hungry. So he ordered a croissant, three, she said, one for Adam, one for Kayla, and one for Harmony, she said, and some hash browns. He drove up, paid the cashier, either got his card or the cash back, whatever, reached in as the cashier is handing him the food, takes the money, hands it to her, and drives away. She
she was, he was scared, she said. And this is what he does, she says. Her story is crazy. And what were the boys doing when this is happening to her sister over and over again? Or they might have been sleeping. No, they were not screaming as they drove up to the cashier to get the food. They might have been sleeping, she doesn't remember. They didn't react much, they were quiet. They didn't cry much. She continues on at the Colonial Village. She thinks at first, maybe they ate at the Burger King, but with more questioning, nope, yep, she was refreshed. They went back to the Colonial Village and she decided to feed the kids. And she said that she took uh, a little bit out of uh, a little piece off of the food and she fed Declan. She said Declan was the middle. She would have to put the food in his mouth, but no, she didn't look back. She just sort of reached back and put it in his mouth. And she took another piece and she would give Seamus also. She didn't have to look. She didn't look back. She didn't see anything back there. And then Harmony's croissant, she just sort of put it back there for Harmony, she said. Didn't look back. She was scared to look back. And then also with that, because she remembered clearly, she didn't have to look back for Declan because he was in the middle and she could just reach right there and put it into his mouth without looking. But then she was reminded that Seamus's car seat was in the middle. Seamus had been in the middle of that accident that was on the 29th. And she had previously said that Seamus was in the middle when she talked to the police and that Harmony was leaning against her brother and that Harmony had a blanket on her lap and that she put a piece of croissant for Harmony on that blanket. She didn't remember this. She made this up. She made it up from feeding the kids when they did go to Burger King. She made it up with some sense of reality. We would go to Burger King and we'd go back and, some, and I'd feed them, and I'd give them pieces in the back, but she had to intersperse her lies to show that she would not have known the condition that Harmony was in. She then goes to Mr. Bordello's, Bordero, sorry, to get some drugs. She didn't remember that she was when, the one that went up, but she was refreshed. She was shown her previous transcript. She not only told the police she went up to buy drugs, but the reason that she went up was that Tony might front her the money because he'd never said no to her. She remembered it at one point, but tried to deny it here. And she claimed that they didn't stay long and they went, she didn't know where, Somewhere, we had to do something, I don't remember what. And when they left, they got to an intersection and the car broke down and that's when they discovered Harmony was dead. In the middle of that broken down, in, broken down in that intersection. Wake up, baby girl. Baby girl, wake up. This horrific story and they didn't know until that intersection. That story is crazy. But then her story even got worse. When I started questioning her about some of those little facts and you remembered how she would respond to me, think about Kayla as you think about what she said. Think about watching her testify. I brought out that she had originally said that Adam had uh, struck Harmony 10 to 15 times at 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning. She said, yeah, that was true. That's when it started, okay? And then he woke up to go to the clinic and Harmony peed again? No. He made her sit, oh, she didn't remember if it was peeing 
or pooping. Sorry to use that word, but I'm just not going to use a different one. She couldn't remember which it was, but he made her sit in it all night, she said. And then did she pee again when you woke up to go to the clinic? Yes, she said. Then when I asked her about that, had somebody cleaned up the offensive poop or pee from two or three o'clock in the morning? No, it, it just smelled of urine when we woke up, she said. She also said that when they were going to the clinic, Harmony didn't have any injuries that she knew of. But beating 10 to 15 times, 2 to 3 in the morning, and no sign? No. That was a lie. It cannot happen. It could not be. And it makes no sense. It doesn't because it's a lie. All that horror, all that chaos at the intersection, oh my god. What could be worse? It's an absolute nightmare. You have done something to a child over and over again for hours, and you get stuck in the intersection, and somehow or other, you've got to make sure that nobody sees that child. Wake up, baby girl. Baby girl, wake up. The description, well, I'll get to the description of the intersection later. No, I won't. What she described at that intersection was that Adam said, went to Kayla, wake up, baby girl. Baby girl, wake up. Put his hand on her heart. And she came over, checked the neck, checked her pulse. And then at some point, somebody is waving cars around, sometimes her, sometimes Adam, she says. She's not seeking help. She's not seeking assistance. She's not doing anything but grabbing the children and grabbing the tro clothes while Adam grabs the duffel bag from the trunk filled with clothes and puts her in the bag filled with clothes from the trunk. When I asked about that, she said, the trunk was actually locked already, but uh, it didn't open. So we had to go through that little hole when you take that center down in the back of a car and you can reach through, you can put your skis through. She said, we went through that and pulled out the duffel bag. That's how we got it. That would be over Harmony's body in a busy intersection, taking off a car seat and taking a child or two out of the car and reaching in and getting a duffel bag full of clothes and pulling it through that little area. There's a reason why she made up that story. And I'll get to it in a little bit. But let me talk to you about waving cars around and not asking for help. Kayla was admittedly part of the cover-up, but she wasn't covering up to save a man who beat a child in a cold, continuous, torturous, escalating over days beating. If that had been going on, Kayla would have instinctually protected that child. By all accounts, Kay uh, Harmony was a loving, lovely child. Instinct would have caused you to protect that child, even if you were given an evil look. And even if you were afraid at some point when you had the opportunity, it's not only a child in the car, it's not only your stepchild. There are two of your children in the car exposed to an absolute horror that no one would allow their children to be held for. She didn't go to, when she went to Badero, she didn't ask for help. 
She didn't ask for call 911. When they were at that intersection, she didn't collapse with, oh my God, it's up, finally. She's waving cars around, she's cool, she's calm, she's getting the kids out, why? Because that wasn't when Harmony died. In that intersection, Harmony was already dead and a plan had already been set for what to do. They had talked for hours before that intersection. They knew what they were gonna do. And that car breaking down at that intersection certainly put a, uh, ruined those plans. But Harmony was already in the trunk. She was already wrapped and in the trunk. And they were going somewhere to take care of what to do with her body. And that is why Adam was able to go into the trunk and grab the duffel bag and walk away without anybody at that intersection seeing Harmony's body, seeing Harmony sitting, lying, being maneuvered around in the car. Because she wasn't. She was in the trunk. Kayla was able to keep her cool because they had been discussing this for hours, what they were going to do. And this problem at the intersection, we can get over it. Keep your cool. She said, Adam said, what do we do? And she said, let's go to Badero's. And they grabbed what they could, and they went to Badero's. Not only if that had occurred, would she have instinctually protected Harmony and her children when she could. Any love that she had for Adam would have died. No one can maintain love for a man who would do something like that over and over again in front of your kids, in front of you, and give you that evil look that made you feel threatened. There are reasons that women stand by their men, but not for that. No one would stand by for that. Why did Kayla stand by Adam? Because that never happened. Adam was not a threat to her because of Harmony's death. Adam was her protector. Wake up, baby girl. <clears throat> True memory that Adam spoke when he unexpectedly discovered that Harmony was unnaturally appearing to be asleep. He didn't even know she was dead. Wake up, baby girl. And she never woke again. I'm going to review with you more of Kayla's lies and some of her reluctant truths that I was able to pull out of her and other of the real evidence. But before I do that, I want you to keep something common sense in the forefront as you evaluate it. I don't think anyone but they can understand the decisions that they made to hide and lie about Harmony's death. But I want you to consider which is more likely, that a mother of her own children and a caretaker by all accounts, a loving and joyful girl she is taking care of, would stand by and protect a man who brutally beat time and time again in front of her and her own children, that beautiful child? Or would a father who failed in his responsibility to care for that beautiful child, would he stand by his wife because he did not know how Harmony died. Kayla and Adam's relationship struggled on after Harmony's death. But till the end, Kayla appeared to put Harmony's death behind her. She just wanted her man. Adam, however, lost his grip several times. After he and Kayla prepared Harmony's body to finally dispose of it, to wash off decomposition and debris in the shower, 
and put her in another bag. He tried to commit suicide. Kayla held him together. You've got to be here for me and the kids. She held him together, but he lost it several more times. He would have bouts of paranoia, think Kayla was trying to poison him, think that there were cameras. He was losing it several times after that. Thought she was cheating. Lashed out on her, punched her a couple of times. And then in March of 2021, St. Patrick's Day, she recalled, he had another bout of par paranoia. And he did this. Why do we have this picture of Kayla with black eyes? Because Kayla took this picture, this selfie, and she sent it to her family. This was something she would not tolerate. He did this to me. Adam was arrested. Adam went to jail. She got a restraining order. She moved. No. She was not an isolated and dependent woman. She wasn't trapped. She had friends. She had family. She was connected to services. Tara. Her friend helped her out of the apartment to a safe place. Adam was arrested. She filed the restraining order. It showed in her actions when Adam, in one of those fits of paranoia, lashed out at her. She was not going to tolerate this. She, she told you, was her own woman. Adam's behavior did not control her. And by the way, Tara Hebert, Hilbert, Hilbert, uh, the one that told you that Adam gave her the lie about Harmony that Kayla and Adam had developed, said Harmony was with her mother. She also told you that that came up in the context of a conversation where he was missing Harmony. Rebecca Maines didn't say he hated Harmony because she reminded him of her mother, Crystal. He was missing Harmony. He was feeling bad. And he moved on quickly when she said, well, where is Harmony? And he said, oh, she's with her mother. And the conversation moved on. He had worked four years visiting Harmony, four years to get her. He knew who Harmony was. He wanted Harmony. In his home, where he lived, in his grandmother's home, where he lived with his grandmother and other uncles and other family members. He wanted her a part of his home. For Kayla, there's no indication she even thought about Harmony until this investigation became public. She wanted Adam, and she didn't want anyone else. She was not relieved when Adam was out of her life. She was not haunted by memories of a brutal assault to an innocent child. She was not haunted by those memories because those memories didn't exist. Her story was a lie. There are no haunting images, except for the ones that might be in your head based on what she has said. but those images do not exist in reality. He had not done that. She told you that after he was in rehab in the summer of 2021, they communicated about getting back together, but then Adam was cheating on her then, and she wasn't happy. Thing, she called Kelsey. She wanted Adam back. She was not haunted. But Adam, in the fall, was out of her life. He was in Maine with Kelsey and her, rec and her relatives. When the investigation opened up and the police tried to come and talk to her, did she say, I'm so sorry. Let me tell you what happened to Harmony. It was terrible. I've held it inside, but it's time you know the truth. Adam is a brute. No, she said, Adam. She calls Adam. She knows where he is. Get back here. I'm not dealing with this alone. 
because they were partners in this conspiracy, get back here. And he came. But he came with his girlfriend, much to Kayla's chagrin. You know, one thing that was odd now, she didn't rely on the police to protect her. She said, Adam threatened her that if she ever told on him, he would have Kevin kill her. Kevin, you met Kevin, the uncle. The uncle that Adam and he were not particularly getting along with because he had failed to pay some bills he had promised to pay and put them in pretty dire straits. The uncle that after a visit and that argument about a week later calls DCYF, the authorities on him. That uncle that you met was no threat to Kayla. That was another lie that she told to try and figure out why, give a reason why she would not have come forward before. She was afraid. I want to talk about another lie that you watch developed. <clears throat> the fuel grinder. What's that all about? Why was that such a big deal here? The fuel grinder. Well, I'm going to remind you how that developed to be an issue in this case. And it did develop over time. You heard that when Kayla first started giving her, police sto her story to the police, she, uh, she was talking about the shower, what happened at Union Avenue, and she was asked, well, were tools used? And she said, no, only the scissors. She had cut off the hoodie. Adam had uh, taken the leggings, and they put Harmony in the shower. She didn't see or know of any tools. And uh, then, on questioning, she sort of saw where it was going, and she said, well, when he came out of the bathroom, he wanted to put her in pieces, but couldn't do it. About eight months later, when she was asked about Adam using tools again, now this eight months from the couple of June conversations in 2021, she gets her deal. She has obligations under that deal. She has to keep cooperating or it could all fall apart. Eight months later, they want to talk to her some more. She's in prison, she's brought out to them, and they have pictures of tools. I assume that their picture was the same size as these, but they had this picture of the fuel grinder. They had a picture of a circular saw, and they had, did they do it backwards? Yes, a picture of a circular saw and a picture of the miter saw. And they asked her about it. And they said, uh, any tools used? And she said, not that I know of. And then they said, uh, they showed her this picture of the grinder. And she said, I had never seen that. I never seen it. They showed her this, and she did not recognize it as anything that she had ever seen before. They showed her the circular saw, and she said, that looks the most like an old tool that Adam had under the counter in a big box. It looks most like it. Miter saw, no. That wasn't it. This looked most like it. And then you learned that uh, she went in March to talk to them. Now, after that March thing, she's going to talk to the state to prepare for her testimony here in front of you. 
She had three of those sessions. They were very long sessions. And they brought a picture, this picture. They brought this picture to that meeting, this picture of a tool that she had never seen before. They brought it to that meeting. And we don't have recordings of that meeting, but she came out of that meeting having given a story of, uh, well, when we were at her mother's house in December, uh, he was interested in his mother's fuel grinder. She had just bought one, it was still in the box, and he saw that and she recognized this tool as the tool on the box. And she said Adam was holding it and said this would be a good tool to use to help get rid of the body. This is December two months ago that she said this. After almost a year before, she said, I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen that. Question first, why would you bring that? Oh, and you don't have to rely on Kayla's word that that was the photo because eventually from Detective Rayhill, we did get out that the third photograph at that uh, March interview where she said, I didn't see that. It wasn't actually identified in the interview, but they had taken this photograph for the purpose of seeing about that Home Depot purchase. Do you remember the Home Depot purchase? The, play, the police were following up on Lime and looking at Lime purchases from Home Depot and they discovered a purchase of lime, the fuel grinder, an extra battery, an extra blade. They wanted to connect that to Adam because it was right around the time that there was a call for service at the shower. That would be evidence that you put together that could prove something. So they want to make that connection. And Detective Rayhill said, we specifically brought this photograph to see if you could identify it to make that connection for us, because they had found that out maybe six months before. She didn't make that connection for them, but they didn't give up. So they brought that photograph, not the police. This was during her prep session. That photograph was brought to the prep session, and she understood this was important. And there was no truth about this other than she had never seen it before, but she made up a story about Adam wanting to take it from her mother. That story is, has so many levels for you to understand Kayla. Oh, and one more thing about that. Uh, I asked her, why didn't you tell anybody before two months ago about um, Adam wanting to steal or take your mother's fuel grinder, why did it take, why did you wait two years to say this, or a year, whatever? And she said, nobody asked me. She also said, I think, in that story that a uh, fuel grinder would, um, Nutri Blender would have been good too. Um, I asked Detective Rahill about whether she was asked about that, and sure enough, as the transcript showed, do you remember him buying anything or stealing anything or any other types of tools like power tools or anything? And she said, no, she was asked about other tools. Then you heard from her mother, the supposed owner of that fuel grinder. Nope, never had a fuel grinder. I have plenty of tools. Um, I do some woodworking stuff. I know fuel grinder. I never had a fuel grinder. I never bought this. Certainly didn't have a new box with a fuel grinder in it at all. Independent verification that her story was a lie. 
but it also illustrates something really important. One, she can gauge what seems to be important to the police or to the state, and she can create a lie to try and give them something that they seem to be looking for. She doesn't understand its importance, but if they're gonna show her this thing again after she said she never saw it, it must be important. And especially with, and I don't know if it was all blown up for her when she signed it. Uh, the other thing it shows you is that she would make up a lie to put the man she says is her best friend most of the time to put him in that bad of a light that in December he's contemplating stealing her mother's power tool, her mother's fuel grinder, contemplating what he can do with it to Harmony's body. Evil, deranged. That is what it says about the story that she can make up to put him in that bad of a light. Was she capable of making up the lie that Adam brutally beat his daughter to death? Yes. Watching that lie unfold tells you, yes, she is capable, and she did do it. Talk about the lime. You put lime on your lawn, you learned, to raise the pH. A lawn where rain happens, dogs play, children play, people play. That is not something that you use to dissolve a body, to make a body decompose. Where she got the lime from, I don't know. Maybe she mistook something that she heard on a crime show. I have no idea. But lime, to decompose a body, nobody has told you that it would do that. And in fact, you learned that it was used to bring pH up on your lawn. And you learned that it wasn't an unusual purchase in the wintertime because Home Depot had sold lime. 33 purchases, I think, within that two month period. And we're not even going to other stores to look and see how many things of lime stole. I don't know where this lime thing came from. What they did was take Harmony's decomposing body that had been decomposing for two months, take her clothes off, put her in the tub, ran the water, and those fluids from decomposition flowed out. Other debris from decomposition flowed out. And it did stop up the drain, <clears throat> but it wasn't lime, and it wasn't dismemberment. And even Kayla says she didn't see any sign of dismemberment. She saw Adam take Harmony's body and put it in these great big trash bags filled with lime. We heard how big the bathroom was. That was a lie. Now. Let's look about the lies she told about Harmony being bit, hidden from view the whole time in the car because she said the beating happened almost right away. From the time, and I confirmed it, you're saying from the time of eviction to the time that Harmony died, you're saying that she was beaten all the time, yep, hidden the whole time, yep, and you pretty much stayed at Colonial Village the whole time without moving, yep. And then you learn. Uh, and she said we did this so that we could har hide Harmony's black eyes and bruises. Whenever anybody would come around, we would put a blanket over her. Nobody saw her. So then you learn uh, that uh, Harmony was not hidden. Harmony was not hidden from the Garcias. You heard Courtney Garcia. They had met up with the Montgomery's. They had given the Montgomery's food. They knew the Montgomery's were living in the car. And Courtney told you, we offered 
to let them stay overnight at our place. And Adam was interested. Kayla was not. Do you remember that? Kayla was not. Adam was interested. Adam was not hiding harmony from view. Harmony wasn't hidden from Christina Lubin. Kayla's mom testified. Kayla had admitted that she went to her mom's the day after Thanksgiving. And she went there to see if her mom could put him up. And her mom couldn't because of the landlord. And eventually, I was able to pull out that she was there. While she was there, she got cleaned up. She cleaned up the kids. They ate. They caught up with each other. Christina told you that she was catching up with her grandchildren, even her step-grandchildren, that she remembered sitting on the couch interacting with Harmony. She was a lovely child, kind of quiet, polite, but she looked healthy. And she noticed Harmony. She noticed her hair in pigtails. Um, she noticed what she was wearing and the glasses, and she interacted with Harmony. There were no black eyes. There were no bruises. Harmony looked good. Harmony wasn't hidden from Tabitha Scott on December 29. Tabitha Scott, you remember, the police officer said, was in the car during the accident on December 29. She was in the front passenger seat while uh, Kayla was in the back with three kids, two car seats. And so that when the police officer came, they threw a blanket over Harmony to hide Harmony. Why? Because of black and blue and bruises? No, because they went to Christina Lubin's after that. There were no black and blue. There were no black eyes. They hid Harmony because they had too many kids in the car and Harmony was not restrained and they had just gotten in an accident. Maybe people overlook it, but not when you've just had an accident and your child is unrestrained. She wasn't hidden from Tabitha Scott that day. So that's two to three days after they've been living in the car now. And then another three days later, December 2nd, she wasn't hidden then. They were in an accident around the clinic. I think it was around the clinic. Anyway, that same officer responded to that accident and also noted again who was in the car. This time it was only Kayla and Adam in the car. Harmony was not hidden from whoever babysat her. Kayla couldn't remember, couldn't tell you, but it could have been Tabitha, it could have been her mother. She didn't remember, but whoever that babysitter was, Harmony was not hidden from that babysitter. And Harmony wasn't hidden from Anthony Badero. Anthony Badero didn't particularly want them there. And, uh, but she said that Anthony walked out every day and Harmony would wave to him. Where did she say this? She said this to the grand jury. She was in the midst of a lie to the grand jury, telling them Harmony on the 30th had gone to her mother's. Adam took her to her mother's. She's lying to the grand jury. She doesn't want to admit anything that is the truth about Harmony once they were evicted. And she sort of slipped. And she said, yeah, well, Anthony Badero, Harmony would wave to him every morning for those two weeks into December. And then Nobody seemed to catch that that was actually different from the lie that she was telling. Just moved on and she continued on her lie. And she admitted to you when I asked, yep, that was a slip, and yes, that was the truth. No need to lie about that to the grand jury because you didn't want to bring that out in the first place. Then, 
I talked about one of the issues that did come up a lot in the car. Ten days from the time that they were evicted to the time that Harmony was discovered dead. Ten days. And she tried to make it seem like 24-7 they were in that car. 24-7 Harmony was hidden. 24-7 they ate. She would change diapers they, and they would stay at the Colonial Village. They didn't do anything. Then I started asking more questions. Do you remember that? Um, well, you changed the babies, the baby and your toddler, they were both still in diapers. You'd change them and you'd wipe them. But to get them really clean, you would take them to a public restroom or something to wipe them down and clean them up with soap and water. Nope. Nope. Didn't happen. Well, um, you, they were in diapers. You needed diapers. You're in there for 10 days. You had to have bought diapers. Went to Walmart, the mall? Nope. Nope. Well, where did you get your diapers? Gas station, convenience store. Think about the prices at a gas station's convenience store. That's not where they were getting their diapers, your wipes, your extra food. They, they wouldn't go far, she kept saying. Well, um, did you clean up the kids at all? Nope. Cleaned them in the car with wipes. Okay, so you didn't go to the bathroom in the car. Where did you go to the bathroom? Okay, that was a problem for her. And uh, you went to the bathroom when you went to Burger King. Yep. And you'd go to Burger King a few times. Yep. And you'd go to the bathroom when you went to gas stations or something to pick up your food and stuff. Yep. And you'd go to the bathroom at Badero's because you were right there at the Colonial, right? Yeah, and you said that Harmony didn't always go with you. That means that Harmony went with you sometimes, right? Yeah, and you'd ask her when you went to the bathroom, do you want to go with me, right? Right. So she went to Badero's with you too, right? Yeah, sometimes. Not all the time, she went in the car a lot. Okay, with work, with prodding, you learn a different story. Harmony is out there. She is not hidden from public. Why does she want to make her? Why does she want to make this story look like that they were 24-7 in a car? Well, you learned why she was working so hard to make that appear. You learned from the state's question that she was aware of opening statement and talked about it with her lawyer. And she said she used the information to prepare her as answers to you. Because the truth pointed to her. That is why she did it. And she knew that these answers were coming and what they would mean. I mean, these questions were coming and what they would mean. So she decided to present a tale of Never Alone with the Kids 24-7 at Colonial. But that tale fell apart as well. Mr. Badero was another person who was caught lying to the grand jury. And he told you he didn't want anything to do with this investigation. He did not want to admit that he had been selling drugs and he did not want to be part of this investigation at all. He said that no, Harmony never waved to him. He never went down to the car. And then he would get turned around and stuff and he would tell a different tale and he said, well, I went down to the car, but not to sell drugs. And uh, maybe I'd wave at the boys, but I didn't see no girl. I didn't see no girl. Okay, what was going on there? Badero, in November 22nd, had just been convicted of another offense involving a drug. One of his prior offenses was distribution, and he also got driving without a license. Uh, yeah, without a license. 
shortly before, another conviction. He had used Adam as a driver, and Adam had used his car back in September, I think. And he did that because he was going to court, and he certainly didn't want to be driving uh, a car without a license going to court. So he needed a ride. Adam drove in the Sebring, and he brought all the kids with him. And he and Badero and the kids were in the car, and I think somebody else. And uh, we go to after the conviction, he's no less afraid of being caught driving his car without a license, what it might lead to. So he's still in need of a driver. Adam just can't use his Sebring. The family is living in the Sebring. And he said, yeah, Adam drove me in my car sometimes. I don't know how many times. It could have been just once. Reducing the amount. Adam was a driver. Why would he not be driving? He's right there. He is, he's got nothing else to do. He's in need of money. They want drugs. Of course, Adam was driving Badero during that time. Kayla even admits that, yep, Adam drove Badero in Badero's car but not while we were living in the Sebring. But not while we were living in the Sebring. But not while we were living in the Sebring. Why? Because that, if you understand that he was driving Badero during that time, it is why Badero is going out in the morning to see Adam, or out daily to see Adam, to get his driver. And it is why Kayla is alone with the children in the it is why Adam did not know until he came back that Harmony was dead. Why does Kayla make up these truths or hide and work so hard to make you think a different story? Because the truth points to her. Sorry. What else supports that Adam was not aware of Harmony's death until he came and shook her? Wake up, baby girl. Let's talk about blood in the car. That was a lie from the beginning. She had told the police, she learned, that uh, while she's claiming that they're all frantically pulling everything together to leave the car that has just broken down at the intersection, she said, Adam gra grabbed a um, Kleenex, I think, and wiped something down in the car. And they asked about that, and she said uh, he had had blood on his hands from striking Harmony and giving Harmony a bloody nose. She assumed that that's what he was wiping up. And, uh, The police officer said, wait a minute, I haven't heard about blood before. What's this? She gets discovery. She knows that they found the car. She knows that there's no blood in the car. So she walks it back. And she says, no, not that day. Um, it was, he was cleaned up. And uh, it was from a bloody nose from an earlier beating a few days before. So no, there was no blood in the car that day. And I started questioning her a little bit more. And um, so are you saying you saw no blood that day? And she said, well, there was dried blood on uh, Harmony's face. And I said, so there was blood that day? And she said, no. That was from the days before that we talked about. OK, well, one of the things that you learned about Blue Star is it wouldn't have mattered whether it was a few days before December 7th, or December 7th. It wouldn't have mattered if he had him had tried to wipe up blood. Blue Star would have found it. And if you're talking about a beating where somebody is leaning over the seat and getting blood on their hands from a bloody nose, then that also would have left a trail somewhere in the car to be found. There was no blood found by Blue Star. 
And that stuff you learned can find blood years later, trace minute amounts of blood. And it did in other places, not necessarily anything related to this. Being out in the elements, being out in swinging temperatures may or may not affect the test, but it can. And it did find DNA on the toothbrush. Those trace things last. There was no blood in the car, around Harmony, around the center console, around the steering wheel, anything to be found by Blue Star, because that never happened. Harmony never had a bloody nose on December 7th or on a few days before. And let me talk about this bloody nose. Think about the amount of beating that Kayla tried to describe. 10 to 15 times at 2 to 3 a.m. Waking up in the morning and again, and all of it, face and head. Going to the clinic, coming out and again. Feedings, driving up the road, stoplights, and again and again and again. And then saying, something was different this time, I think I heard her. That child would have been as bloody as you can possibly imagine. Why did Kayla slip about the blood and then back it off? There was no blood. Her story was a lie. I lose my place often. I'm very sorry. I know that you're being very patient with me. The police took this investigation very, very seriously. You heard it was one of the biggest ones that they've ever conducted. Hours and dedication of the officers can't be denied. And it's something that we all hope for in our police officers when we need them to help us. And the emotions that come with danger to a child, a missing child. Now, at the time when the investigation started, she would have been seven. Pictures. Of that adorable child in the media, pulling in the community. Help us find this girl. The media is all over it. It's the biggest thing, the biggest investigation Manchester police did, and they dedicated time, resources, over and over and over again. The emotions had to be running high. And they kept going down wrong paths because people would give them information, whether it was that they wanted to help and they were wrong, whether it was, as Adam horribly put it in his recording, they wanted their two minutes of fame, or they wanted something like Kayla, or maybe Rebecca Maines, or they just, who knows. They went down those black holes, and they were willing to do it because to not go there might mean that they miss something real. And they would not regret going down those black holes and doing all those searches. But they can, and they should, and it is right to feel anger. That never should have happened, and Adam and Caleb both could have prevented that from happening. But they lied about her death, and they covered her death up. And you can feel that emotion as well. It is okay. And you can hold Adam accountable for what he did. But emotion equally shows you that Kayla is lying. She continues to lie, and she made a few things up in front of you. Remember how you felt watching her. 
and evaluate that because that will also show you she's lying because she has something to hide still because the truth points to her. Adam did some very, very bad things, but he did not kill his daughter. His choices got him where he is today. He has no one but himself to blame. He did what he did, and he got blamed for something he did not do. He put himself in that position. But the evidence that you can rely on remains the evidence in this courtroom and the view, not the emotion, not the horror of what she described, the slow, methodical evaluation of what she described compared to the other evidence. And can you put your trust for one of the most important decisions of your life in Kayla? Because that is what you'd have to do. There's no doubt that the police know that she's a liar. The state knows that she's a liar. She charged with perjury, lying to the grand jury. She's charged twice, but you watched her as I asked her over and over again all those questions to the grand jury. This is a lie? Yeah. This is a lie? Yeah. This is a lie. And some of those details that she wove around that lie that she has to admit today those details were made to make her story seem real. But sometimes she slipped, and the truth came out, like it did when she said, Harmony would wave to Tony Badero every day. Take those emotions, recognize those emotions, and put them aside like you said that you were able to do. I haven't talked about the second degree assault case at almost at all, I don't think. Um, Kevin made the accusation, you watch. He was in a fight with Adam between Kayla and Kevin, you've heard the fight was about money as well as Kayla's black eye. And what did he say, seven, a week later, maybe 10 days later, he called uh, DCYF. Well, that was investigated. Uh, Mr. Tseros came out, took a couple of times, but he came out and he talked to Harmony and he talked to Adam and he talked to the family and he checked things out. And he has a series of things that he is checking out to determine if a child is okay, if she's safe, the things to do for his investigation. As a result of all that, nothing, nothing. Until two years later, when they're investigating Adam and they want to get him, he's arrested for that second degree assault charge for what Saros was content with the situation to hold him so that he was in jail from January 4. Kayla went to jail a couple of days later. You also learned that it was not because, as Rebecca Maines put it, Adam hated Harmony because she reminded him of her mother. Because you heard people like Katie Morin who said uh, the memory bothered him. It bothered him that he had struck her and given her a black eye, struck her glasses and given her a black eye. It bothered him, even after he knew that she was dead, striking Harmony, when he found her with her hand over Declan's mouth. It bothered him. And Terry Hebert, he missed Harmony. I do appreciate your patience, and I'm coming to the worst part of the case for me. It's the part where I have to stop, and I can't talk. I've got a little bit more. But I can't bring out more information from you. All the information is in, and I don't get to get up 
and say, but wait a minute, wait a minute, don't forget this. The state is going to give their closing after me, and I imagine it's going to be very different from what you just heard from me. And I can't get up and say, wait a minute, yes, this person said this, but look at the context of what they said. Look at somebody like Nicole Giles, who said, I saw bruises on Kayla's torso and on her body, and uh, this was at the Fitz shelter before they ever went to Union, and uh, it bothered me. Kayla's friend, Nicole, when she was first talked to at the beginning of the investigation in January of 2022, the month that Kayla and Adam were arrested, she was asked about those sorts of things and she said, no, I never saw any sign of domestic violence. No, I didn't see anything, no. And then I think it was a year later that she comes out with this story. Everybody was affected by that picture of Harmony. Everybody was affected by the media and all the police efforts that went in to find this child. And some people wanted to contact police, talk to police, and be a part of it. But Nicole Giles, when she was first spoken to, said no. So if the state talks about what Nicole says, I won't be able to get up and say, wait a minute, she didn't say that at first. That was with all the exposure over the year. She made up that story to help her friend Kayla when she was talking neutrally without knowing anything. No DV. Let's talk about uh, Rebecca Maines. <clears throat> she sounded like a pretty decent person uh, standing up for her wrongs in her past, taking responsibility, understanding it. But boy, did she get her hair up when Jamie, attorney Brooks, started asking about these things. I've admitted I'm a criminal. Don't go down that road. No, she is still denying her status as a criminal because she doesn't want to hear it anymore. She got her hair up and she said no. When I talked to them in January of 2023, I wasn't looking to get anything. When I talked to them, I wasn't facing any charges. I was already convicted and in jail. Then you learned, no, she was facing charges. She was facing the charges that are still pending now. And um, I think she said that she wasn't getting any additional time. There are plenty of reasons that people say what they say. With Rebecca, I can't go through the changes. You heard that she had several interviews and not when, what came out when. But you do know that she did have a reason to want to give something to the police, and what she gave to the police actually didn't fit anything else. Adam worked four years to get Harmony. He didn't hate her because she reminded him of Crystal. He loved her and wanted her in the house, with his, in his grandmother's house, with his family, his immediate family and his bigger family. And he wanted to raise her. Things absolutely fell apart after. But he didn't hate Harmony. And her story about, I don't remember if it was urinating, peeing or pooping, putting in the corner, there's nothing about a car. She's taking bits and pieces of information that is out there in the media and trying to make her own story that's bad about Adam, but maybe can help her in her troubled situation. No, nobody can help me. I'm already doing my parole violation. I was done. Nope. There were three sets of charges pending, and she even corrected it. No, there's four. 
And she's not expecting to do any time, I think she said, for those that were out there. Any more time. So, back to the end. You don't get to rely on your emotions. And I've seen a few times, if you've looked at your face, and it's pretty clear that there have been emotional reactions to some of the testimony. There may have been some reactions of anger when you heard Adam's recording, knowing all the time and effort and services and resources and money that was put into this case because of choices that he made. And he's saying they're wasting taxpayers' money. Yeah, you can get mad at that. But then you stop and you say, okay, that's bad. Let's look at the facts. What is proof beyond a reasonable doubt? Well, Remember the recording, I think you all got a video before you came out into the big room to be um, determined if you were going to be chosen or not. And in that recording, they talked about different tests about what is reasonable doubt um, or what are the different burdens. And one burden was um, preponderance of the evidence. If the evidence favors one side over the other, that is a test and that side is the side that gets your verdict. Then there's something very much higher than that, clear and convincing. And it happens in certain types of cases where you have to be clearly convinced that your verdict is correct before you can make it. And then there is something even higher, beyond a reasonable doubt, that you look at all the evidence without the emotion and you determine has the state proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt? Do you know, in your heart of hearts, do you know, not that this decision seems to make you feel good, do you know that it is right? Do you know if they have met their burden? There's any doubt, we're not talking aliens, we're not talking crazy stuff, we are talking about Trusting Kayla. If there is a doubt, a reasonable doubt, there is a reasonable doubt to not trust Kayla with any important decision. If you have that doubt, you must find Adam not guilty. That is your test. And this verdict could be easy and it could be quick if you rely on emotion. If you rely on anger, if you rely on horror, because what Adam did, what he did do to Harmony's body after she died is horrific. What he did do by allowing that entire investigation to go for so long can make you very, very angry. And if you decide this case based on your emotions, it can be a quick verdict because none of those emotions will be positive. But if you take the time, you take a breath, and you go through the evidence piece by piece, evaluate, talk to each other. What do you think about her testimony? Some of you will remember things different from others talk it out, what was correct. Some of you might remember things different from what I said, I'm human, but talk it out. What is right here, what is there, what is missing, what is crazy, and what is fact. If you do that, this is a very, very difficult case because those emotions are there. If you do that, if you put it aside, Adam is not guilty of murdering this girl. He did not do that. And he's not guilty of witness tampering. Table. He didn't influence her testimony at all. It was in her best interest. A lie 
the high and to make up more lies as time went along because the truth hurts. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, what we're going to do now is I'm going to I'm going to we'll take a 15-minute uh, break so that you can use the restroom, have a drink of water, then we'll come back. Uh, it'll be the uh, state's opportunity to make closing arguments to you. Then I anticipate uh, that we'll probably go directly into final instructions. And at that point, once you have the final instructions, we'll select the alternates, the jury four person, and it will be time to deliberate. Um, so. For now, just uh, take a stretch, uh, have a drink of water, use the restroom, and then we'll bring you back in for the rest of closing arguments uh, and instructions. All rise for the jurors, please. You may
everybody ready? Yes, sir. Yes? Okay. Attorney Smith, Attorney Brooks, ready? Yes. 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 Okay. All rise for the jurors. Please be seated. Whenever you're ready. Good morning again, everyone. I want to thank you very much for the time that you have spent in this case for a journey that we told you back before we took the view was going to be a journey that you weren't going to forget. It has been a long couple of weeks. You have been incredibly attentive, and we are very, very appreciative of that. One of the things you heard just a moment ago from Attorney Smith was that she doesn't get the opportunity to come back up here and talk again. That's true. It's called taking turns. It's something that parents teach children. At the beginning, the state has to go first, the defendant has to go second. At the closings, the defendant has to go first, the state has to go second. Something very simple that parents teach children. One of the other things that they should teach is if you're going to quote the defendant, if you're going to quote a witness, you have to make sure that you're accurate. So I'll apologize in advance, but let's quote people accurately. I fucked up. Again and again and again. I fucked up. I fucked up. That's what the defendant, his language, that he used when he told Travis Beach at the night he got the U-Haul, the night that he disappeared Harmony's body, to whatever place it is now, where he knows it is right now, to this day, his words, I fucked up. Not she, not we, not Kayla, I, I fucked up. Singular, personal, solo. That's the defendant's words. Defense counsel got up here in openings and said that you'd hear evidence that Adam Montgomery was out in the middle of the night doing his business when something happened and Harmony died. If that were so, the defendant never would have told Travis Beach, I fucked up. Adam Montgomery was no loving, caring parent but an enraged tyrant who had no business being around Young Harmony. So together, let's look at the actual evidence, the actual quotes of what you saw and heard as we look at all of the charges that you're going to deliberate on that encapsulate what the defendant did do and talk about the evidence that you've seen tells you what he committed. And we'll start first with what the defendant's telling you in opening arguments and now that you can and should find him guilty of abuse of a corpse and falsifying physical evidence. Let's set that as the baseline. Let's start there. Let's see what that actually means before we look at how he committed every, up, each one of the crimes charged, not just the ones that he feels are going to distract you from the rest of the nightmare that he's responsible for. Who carried Harmony's body away from the broken down car in the duffel bag, hit her outside a colonial village while they stayed in Anthony Badero's blue Audi for two nights, put Harmony under a ramp and then in a van, and then in this cooler for weeks at Christina Lupin's house, into the CMC bag, into the walk-in cooler at Portland Pie Company, in the fridge, in the freezer, defrosted her in the shower, consolidated her body yet again brought her to the Econo Lodge, tricked his friend into renting him the U-Haul, and then dumped her body somewhere. All 
to make sure that the evidence that could have been brought before you that shows that he's responsible for having murdered her would never be found. And he says you can and should find him guilty of those two crimes, of abuse of a corpse and falsifying physical evidence for this. He doesn't dispute this. The defense said all of that in their openings, that the defendant did both of these two bolded things. Since day two of this trial, opening arguments, you should then consider not only all of the testimony, but also all of the corroborating testimony about all of those charges, those two, falsifying physical and abuse of a corpse, to be true. So let's make it very, very painfully clear from the indictments that you're going to be considering for falsifying physical evidence and abuse of a corpse, making this harmony fit into this and disappearing her body in the condition that it could not be found for a trial like this one. The evidence was there. And the defendant's counsel professed to you that he's not disputing that, not saying he didn't commit these crimes. So you can check these two off the list. And with that, you got to remember the defendant gets no credit for this. He says that you can and should find him guilty of these, but he's not taking responsibility for him. He hasn't admitted anything. He's not taking responsibility for anything that he did. His argument to you is not because he's taking responsibility. It's tactical. He admits what he can't deny. And he denies what he can't afford to admit. He cannot deny each and every single one of these facts that were presented to you. That she died on the 7th, that he brought her in a duffel bag to Colonial Village, stored her under a deck, into a red cooler, in the closet it fit, in the ceiling it built. It's her blood in the ceiling at the fit shelter at 177 Lake Ave. And his fingerprints in the ceiling, remember, <coughs> left-handed prints, in the ceiling, the only other person being poor Mr. Mondrag, the drywall installer, into the CMC bag to the Portland Pie Company, over to Union Street, consolidating her body even more, bringing her into the Econo Lodge, <coughs> tricking Travis Beach, and dumping her body so it wouldn't be found. The argument that the defendant is making, he had to make. His concessions don't mean he's taken responsibility for these crimes. It doesn't mean that he's a man of principle or restraint, nor does it give his argument any credibility that because I concede all of this, well, the rest of it must not be true. The whole thing's true. And he's taken responsibility for none of this. So again, baseline, first things first, before we move on, these two charges and the charges that his counsel argued can and should find him guilty of, they're there. That's done. And that's the tip of the iceberg. It's all of the charges, every single one of them, has been proven by evidence, not emotion, beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is the man who did all of these things. And that's because you saw the evidence. You went on the view. You saw witnesses take this stand and put themselves before you and you looked him in the eye, and the same common sense that you use every day to tell whether somebody is feeding you a lion, a bull, or not, you used with those witnesses. And because of that, you know that this is true. Because you heard from people, like Kevin Montgomery, Nick Ahern, Katie Moore, and all talking about the defendant telling them in July about the worst thing he had ever done up until that point. You heard from Kayla two days from Kayla, and all of the other witnesses that corroborate her, how he beat Harmony, this 35-pound child. 
remember Nurse Travers told you that she was measured just back in June before the July incident occurred. 35 pounds, five years old, 35 pounds. And you heard from all those witnesses, especially Kayla, about why he beat Harmony to death, when he beat Harmony, and how he beat Harmony, and you vetted what she had to say. And you saw the rest of the injuries that he incurred, that he incurred and all of that was corroborated by the other evidence presented corroborated in ways that we'll explore that the witness never could have possibly known there was other evidence out there that supported them. Not when the defendant started telling investigators what happened and how the defendant beat the life out of Harmony. And then beat and manipulated and controlled Kayla afterwards to make sure that she stuck to the story so he would not be held accountable and the evidence of his crimes would not be found. So when he says that you can find him guilty of these, understand that these two are but a part of the whole of his criminality, of how he murdered Harmony as well. When he said this to Travis Beach, it wasn't for part of that. It was for the whole of taking Harmony's life and beyond. Don't forget what he's saying that you ought to convict him on as well. That the falsifying physical evidence and that the abuse of corpse are un themsel unto themselves evidence of the crime of murder. He's a murderer. That's getting rid of evidence. That's what murderers do. They get rid of evidence that would show others what they've done. They think no body, no evidence, no conviction. They silence witnesses into staying silent or even perjuring themselves so that the witnesses don't tell others what the murderer did. Because murderers don't want to be held accountable for their actions. Murderers want to get rid of the evidence. They don't mind abusing the body so that the evidence of how their victim was murdered can never be found or used against them. They clean bathrooms with ammonia after they get rid of the evidence, like this defendant did. They clean out the plumbing lines, like this defendant wanted to do. They desecrate and hide the dead so that the body cannot tell the story of how they died to the living. That's what murderers do. That's what the defendant did, because he's a murderer too. Now, let's really start now. Let's start and talk about what he did first to Harmony. Excuse me. Let's talk about what happened in June. Let's talk about the second degree assault. You will likely never forget Kevin Montgomery's testimony as he was sitting up here, taking his time to thoroughly make sure he answered truthfully and recalled to the best of his recollection. And you are never gonna forget how he described Harmony's face when he flew home from Florida, having been there in July, come back on the 22nd to see Harmony in the house in the kitchen. And we saw him relive that moment for us, admitting that he asked her, quote, oh my God, Harmony or, oh my fucking God, Harmony, what did you do to your face, end quote. And how he told us Adam answered the question. Not Harmony, Adam did. She didn't do anything. I bashed her around the fucking house. That's not disciplining a child. That's not pulling her away or jerking her and not protecting someone else. If it had been, the defendant never would have said this when Kevin asked Harmony what happened, would he? Kevin Montgomery told you he was subpoenaed to be here. He did not want to testify against his nephew. And you saw it on his face that he remembered what the defendant said he did. Not Harmony answering the question, the defendant answered it for her. And remember how Kevin said, the defendant said this. Another moment, probably not gonna forget, 
when I asked Kevin about how the defendant said he bashed her around the house. Kevin, you'll recall, said, quote, like a cocky son of a bitch. Nick Ahern told us he saw that black eye and how bad it was. And what did the defendant do? Lied to him. Nick told us how the defendant told him that it was from an injury from playing soccer. Nick told you he only saw it for what? How many seconds? Four seconds. Only saw it for four seconds. Saw how bad it was. He described it as being pretty intense, that it was concerning to him, and that the defendant let her be outside for all of four seconds before the defendant told her to get back inside. And what did Harmony do? She obeyed. Nick saw him walk Harmony right back through the front door and then shut it. And so why did Nick hide Harmony away that day? Because he couldn't let a five-year-old outside on a summer day, could he? Not when her face showed the mark of the assault that he had delivered on her. Shows everyone in the neighborhood along with Nick evidence of what the defendant did to her. Katie Morin told us that the defendant used other words to describe that day and what he did besides bashing her around the house. Did she say a jerk? Did she say a grab? Did she say a yank? She did not. The defendant told her it was, quote, the worst thing I'd ever done, end quote. And that he had supposedly backhanded her. That tells you that the defendant knew how badly he beat Harmony that day in July that the defendant called it to Katie Morin the worst thing that he had ever done. And the evidence from the multiple people who saw how bad this was and who heard the defendant describe either inflicting it upon her or hiding her. Don't forget, we also have Demetrio Saros. When he first went to the house, was he able to see Harmony? He told you, only from feet away as the defendant was hurrying up and getting Harmony in the car and driving her out of there. And even a week later, when he finally does get to see Harmony, she still has a mark on her face. Finally, you've also got Kayla Montgomery, who told you she overheard the defendant's conversation with Kevin Montgomery and then confronted him because he told her it was from a lightsaber that one of the boys had been swinging around and Harmony got hit in the face. And she confronted him about it and said, you said it was from a lightsaber. He said, yeah, no. What I said to Kevin was correct. He admits that he lied to her before when he told Harmony, I was here, when he told Kayla that Harmony got hit by a lightsaber. More evidence that corroborates that what Kevin said happened his conversation with Adam, where Adam admitted to hitting Harmony in July, did happen. Simply put, from multiple witnesses, from the defendant's multiple confessions, he committed the crime of second degree assault on a five-year-old in July of 2019. And of that, there is simply no doubt. That being said, now, now we can move on. Who and where and why Harmony was killed? Let's go through what the evidence showed us one thing at a time. We saw that it was not alone with Kayla, not in the Colonial Village parking lot in the middle of the night where Adam had gone to go do his business, not that it was something that you heard that it happened. It was the defendant in the car on the morning of the 7th with his fists. And it was cold. We know it was cold. So cold that Badero's car died that night when they moved over into the Audi. Adam wrote to Matt Gendron, remember that they were freezing. Cold enough so that Kim Frayne went and gave them the battery pack to help give them the jump start. So we know it must have been cold enough that day that blankets in the back of a car did not appear out of place. Kayla told us how the accidents were happening, and yes, something had happened the night before, but she told you the night before was when the defendant first hit her. 
for an, why? For another accident that Harmony had had in the car. An accident that Kayla did nothing about. An accident that the defendant did nothing about and told Kayla to let Harmony lie in it. Kayla told you what it smelled like and she told you to your face that she still did nothing about it. And in the morning, things were still the same. Kayla described for you how it started up again. It was still dark outside. She told you the first blow in the morning, it was still dark outside. We know that, why? Because it's December 7th. Because it's before they get to the methadone clinic and we know that the check-in times there are 7.05 and 7.09. And you know how dark it is in December, just a couple of days away from the darkest day of the year, December 22nd. So when the defendant gets out of the car, goes in and gets his methadone and then comes back, he finds Harmony has done it again. The smell of her inability to control her bladder and her bowels, something that she used to be able to do just fine for years. It's back again in his car again. The last place that he has, the only place that he has. And what does the man whom Kayla saw be so rageful do. And remember, that rageful wasn't just seen by Kayla, wasn't it? We heard from Rose Smith, the driver, years later, 2021. She told you that after giving Kayla a ride to the methadone clinic with Adam and coming back, that Kayla had had bruises that day, terrible black eyes, and that she tried to give her phone to Kayla. And her words were that when he wrenched that phone out of her hands, he told her, you are not giving that phone to my wife. And she described his face how? A look of pure rage. What does that person do when they get back to the car after their methadone and Harmony has soiled herself again? All he has is his car and his rage and his fists. And Kayla described for you how that went on. For the length of time that the same length of time that you took driving from the clinic here on Market Street up to the Burger King on Hooksit Road, you drove that drive. You know how long that is. And as the smell continued, she described that the hitting continued. And Harmony took blow after blow until she was moaning. And the defendant points to the fact and says, well, other people, they should have been able to see in the car. It's cold. It's dark. We know there's snow on the ground. Snow in New Hampshire means salt, which means the windows probably look the exact same that yours and mine did this morning. It's not easy visibility. Plus, think about it. <coughs> It doesn't take a lot to be able to punch down on a five-year-old, 35-pound child and make sure that it's below the windowsill. Not for him. Not for Adam Montgomery. Not against Harmony. Not in that car. And you saw from the Walmart video and the video from Officer Stanzel when they first approached the defendant, when he was trying to find where Harmony was, you saw from that how the defendant looked. Remember him at Walmart. He's not a small or a weak man. He wouldn't need to use much power to inflict deadly force upon Harmony's skull. And you heard it wasn't from one blow of his arm, but several. Take a moment, let's talk, just take a break and talk about something that defense brought up, the fact that there are other child, other children in the car and why wouldn't they have been screaming and yelling. I remember that, uh, that front catchphrase she tried to get mm -hmm. Kayla to say, a cascade of chaos would have ensued. We know young children adapt to their environment like nobody's business. They're frightened by new faces, they're frightened by new experiences, or the unexpected, but they're not frightened by something that's familiar. 
Why would the other children cry if Harmony had been getting hit and punished in the car? After all, this was the second time in less than 12 hours that they would have seen this if they were awake. They would not have been unfamiliar with his rage towards Harmony in that car. The defendant's theory that punishing Harmony for soiling herself would make the other children cry implies that this is unfamiliar to them. And the evidence shows that it is not. Kayla rejected that cascade of chaos every single time it was proposed to her. And both Kayla and common sense tell you that that makes sense, that that's true. Now, when they got to Burger King, the damage at that point had already been done. As Kayla told you, Harmony laid under the blanket. No one went to get help for her. Not the defendant who beat her, not for Kayla either. And what did the defendant say in that moment? Words matter. I think I hurt her this time. This time. This time. I think I hurt her. I think I did something. Why say this? Because he didn't do nothing. He did something. He took her life in rage over a bathroom accident. And he admitted in his opening that you can and should find him guilty of abusing her corpse and falsifying physical evidence for what he did afterwards to get rid of the evidence, get rid of her, get rid of the evidence that would have shown he murdered her. But it was the evidence of his crime of beating her. I fucked up. I think I did something. I think I hurt her this time. That's what he believed. <coughs> You saw Kayla testify. You heard for two full days, practically, while she was on the stand, having to tell you what she saw having happened. And Kayla did nothing. She did nothing. She did not parent Harmony. She did not clean Harmony. She did not change Harmony when she soiled herself. And the defendant told her to leave her in it. She didn't stop the defendant. She didn't try to get Harmony help. She didn't call 911. She didn't yell out. She didn't run out of the car. She didn't disobey the defendant. She's not seeking help. She's not seeking attention. He went through the trunk to get her, not her, because she did nothing. Later, she didn't betray him until after she even lied in grand jury and committed perjury for him. She didn't lift a finger. She did nothing, nothing at all. The defendant wants to have their cake and eat it too when they come to describe her. She's an abuser, but she did something in the middle of the night. She didn't see anything here, but she saw it all. She wants the defendant. Oh, she doesn't want the defendant. Believe her grand jury testimony, but don't believe her grand jury testimony, the part where she said she lied. That part you should actually believe, even though she's telling you it's a lie. Want to have their cake and eat it too when it comes to her testimony. Well, you know, she would have been really conscientious when she was shopping for diapers. Because that's, if you're homeless, yeah, that would make sense. You want to go where you can get the cheapest price. She's a drug user, she's homeless. And for Harmony, she does nothing. They want to argue, well, she would have had this instinct to protect that child. Oh, but she did something to her in the middle of the night. She did nothing. We are tested, all of us, just a few moments in our lives to do the right thing, where our character as human beings is tested to do the right thing. And on this test, December 7th, with where Kayla Montgomery was back in that life, she failed. At grand jury, she failed. She still obeyed him. Even though he had run off to Maine with a second girlfriend since then, she still obeyed him. Katie Morin told you that back then, Kayla would have done anything for the defendant. That's what her protector 
did to her. He had her conditioned so well, physically and mentally, that she kept his secret, and she did nothing. You saw that in her testimony when she told you about doing nothing. And she told you about not stopping him from hitting Harmony. And she admitted, unashamedly, without reservation, she didn't try to take Harmony to the bathrooms to clean her up. She didn't try to get her help. She did obey. She took Harmony's body to Portland Pie when he told her to later. Sitting her between her two children in the stroller for that 15 minute walk down the street. But she did nothing. You don't have to like her to believe her. You don't have to like what she did. You may have very good reasons for hating her, but that doesn't change the fact that she saw the defendant beat Harmony to death. That doesn't change her credibility on telling us what the defendant did. Just because you believe that her failure to do the right thing is despicable, that doesn't mean that on this she's not Incredible. She actually tried to humanize this guy. Remember her testimony? She cried. And she said to you and admitted that she still cares about him. Her in prison. Harmony somewhere. Only he knows. And she still cares about him. And she admits how she did nothing for Harmony. If she was singing for her supper, like the defendant suggested in their opening, she wouldn't have done that, would she? She would have an answer for every question, an excuse for every moment that she did nothing. She didn't have that on the stand. She would never have admitted that she didn't take the kids to the bathroom or that she let Harmony sit in it that night. And yet she did that someone who's not making up a story to make herself look better, is it? She never would have admitted that when Harmony is covered by the blanket as they get their food from Burger King, that she unceremoniously dumped a breakfast sandwich on top of the blanket. Harmony can open that herself. After the defendant had covered her and smashed her face. And yet, that is what she told you happened. Kayla admitted to you that she did nothing. It's not the face of a person who's trying to make themselves out to be the saint and the defendant to be the devil. That's certainly not a master criminal schemer trying to exonerate her own behavior as you just heard in closing arguments. She is not like the defendant. She's not admitting that she, what she can't deny and denying what she can't afford to admit because if she did, she would have never admitted to her failure to act to protect Harmony. She would have never denied doing the small things. She would have claimed, oh, I did do those. I tried to redeem myself. And how she comes across, how she testifies. What she is, is a battered woman admitting an inconvenient and terrible truth that she failed in a moment of life when her character was put to the test. She did nothing to help Harmony, nothing to stop her, she didn't kill her. Only the defendant did that. So when defense counsel says that it was Kayla who put Harmony in a duffel bag in the trunk and told Adam about it later, you heard and saw Kayla testify, she did nothing for her. Not a thing. And you can't get something from nothing. And the defendant's promise at opened, openings that you'd see she did something remains exactly now as it was then and it's a false promise you've seen that theory with evidence presented to test it and it is still without support it is still without corroboration and it is still unreasonable to believe because it was the defendant who did something when you consider kayla's testimony don't consider it alone Consider it with all of the facts that go along with that testimony. Facts such as that she does have an agreement, an agreement to tell the truth. Defense counsel questioned her and argued that, well, she had to give the police a lot more 
to get out of the additional lies that she said in grand jury. But remember, if she doesn't tell the truth, all of this comes back on her. It's back to square one for her. Her agreement is null and void. But the evidence that you saw, how thoroughly the police investigated this case, where Harmony is, location after location after location in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, 900 plus pieces of evidence to help find out what happened has only corroborated Kayla about who killed Harmony, about when she died, who hit her, who mangled her body, and who dumped her where she is now, somewhere between here and the Tobin Bridge in Massachusetts. Corroboration, big, fancy, five-syllable word that stands for evidence that supports that a statement is true. If you just had Kayla's testimony alone, with her truthful testimony on the elements of the crime charged, that would be enough for you to go ahead and find the defendant guilty of all the charges. But you don't just have her testimony. You have so much more. Because every witness, 50 witnesses, that came in and testified to you about and provided evidence, I provide some corroboration for Kayla's account of what happened in ways that she never could have known. And that includes testimony and evidence that corroborates her, to her on how Kayla died, and, I'm sorry, how Harmony died, and why the defendant killed Harmony. Why her body was desecrated. How Kayla was silenced for so long. And how the defendant discarded Harmony like trash so she wouldn't be found. Let's look at just one example. How do we know that Kayla's telling the truth when she told us how the defendant tried to induce or cause her to stick to his story, to not testify, to not tell people how he murdered and disposed of Harmony. How do we know that Kayla's telling the truth on that, tampering with her as a witness? It's because the evidence corroborates it. Nicole Giles told us that Kayla was still at the fit on Lake Avenue, the Families in Transition Shelter, when she saw bruises on Kayla's body. This is back in January of 2020, before Harmony was ever known to be missing. And Kayla is admitting to Miss Giles that the defendant is beating her. And she, what? She asked Miss Giles not to tell anyone. Having just been homeless, now living in a transition shelter with two younger children, and having been tested before and failed to get help for a child, she stays silent. She obeys and sticks with the defendant's story. Despite her abuse later, we see that as well from the testimony of Roseanne Smith. Rose Smith, who was giving her that ride for methadone that morning, saw the beating that Kayla had taken the night before. And as she again saw pure rage in the defendant's face as he came and wrenched the phone out of Rose's hands, saying, you're not going to give my wife that phone. So much so that when you heard and saw Rose testify, you heard her say, Ever since then, she refused to drive them around anymore. That she carries pepper spray now. And she said, quote, something I will never forget. Kayla is under control and doesn't say what happens to Harmony throughout that time period. And he believes that she's helping police. You heard testimony about how he believed the police were listening in on him and tracking him, and that he was ripping light fixtures down, that he was breaking thermostats and electronics. Kayla told you that he was paranoid that she was working with police and was being listened to. It's not a sign of mental illness. It's not a sign of being sad. A sign of guilty conscience. A sign that you want to continue to exert control, and you should think of it as such. That's corroborated by Dennis Cloutier. Remember the handyman at 644 Union Street. He saw the ripped down electronics, the broken thermostats, and he made the repairs. We also see more of that witness tampering from the testimony of Tara Hilbert, next door on Orange Street, when Kayla finally does escape physically the clutches of the defendant. To the cycle of abuse that he had perpetrated for so long, the defendant didn't want to be found out. And since Kayla, excuse me, he silenced Kayla because he didn't want to be found out what he had done. And you know that from the very beginning. 
Don't forget the Facebook messages to Travis Beach. The U-Haul was still out there. What did he tell Travis? The day after, the next morning, when he's trying to find out, Travis is trying to find out where the van, because it's supposed to be back. What does he tell Travis right then? Please don't message me stuff like this on Facebook again. Just like getting rid of the body and destroying physical evidence, convincing witnesses to what you've done to stay silent, that's what murderers do. That's what this defendant did. They silenced them into staying silent. And the defendant did that for so very long, he made sure that it was his story that was being told. He continued to tell his story and different variations of it to everybody, his lie that he created. To Christina Lubin, remember, this would have been the first day after they got booted out of Anthony Badero's Audi at Christina's place, tells her, I dropped her off in Massachusetts with her mother. Jessica Guerin tells her over a year later, in, while she's de delivering a, a gift for her boyfriend, tells her at that time, Oh, my other daughter, yeah, uh, she's down in Massachusetts, and quickly changes the subject. Demetrios Saros, the former DCYF employee, tells her, no, nope, sent her down to her mother in Massachusetts, did that right around Thanksgiving. Courtney Garcia, who sees Harmony in the car on Thanksgiving Day and not there just a couple of weeks later, what's the defendant's story? What does the defendant, not Caleb, what does the defendant tell all of these people and tell Courtney Garcia? Dropped her off at my mother's. She was having bathroom problems. No, I'm sorry, dropped her off at her mother's. She was having bathroom problems. Tells Rebecca Maines, dropped her off with her biological mother. Biological mother doesn't even let me see her. A clever lie that works if Kayla sticks to the story that he's told everyone. And it did for a long time. It's why Kayla's in prison today. And corroborating evidence comes not only from the witnesses, but again, from evidence of receipts and from photographs. Because a picture does speak a thousand words. That is not the face of the person who's in control. It's the face of the person who was kept under control. She needed to be kept under control so that what the defendant did to his daughter would not be found out, and it worked for a long time. But all the witnesses who corroborate all, the te all testified to a different aspect of seeing the control that he exerted on Kayla and the stories that he told others to stop her from actually working for the police and to stop her from telling police what really happened. That's about what he does to her. But what else corroborates Kayla about why Harmony was killed? The defendant again, not only about why, but telling Courtney Garcia and Rebecca Maines that why she is no longer with him, or one of the reasons at the time he gets rid of her, is because she's having bathroom accidents. So you know that that's the reason why he did what he did to her on the morning of December 7th. He's still mad about why this happened. He's still talking about it. Months with Rebecca Maines, years later, it's why he killed her, having accidents in the car. When Kayla said that the defendant hit her overnight and says words of, you have to stop doing this, that's corroborated by what he told Courtney Garcia and Rebecca Maines, that he got rid of Harmony because she was having accidents. Rebecca Maines told us just yesterday, a friend of his, a close friend of his, that these accidents are what made him take Harmony away. To what did Rebecca testify? The defendant told her a better place for Harmony. A better place. He told her that he thought Harmony was having these accidents on purpose. And Courtney Garcia especially recalled that the defendant said the accidents were happening while they were living in the car. So when the defendant says there's no evidence to support Kayla about what happened in the car, you know that's not true. Rebecca Maines could not have been clearer yesterday when she told you and clarified for both sets of counsel that the defendant told her he hated Harmony because Harmony reminded him of Harmony's mother.
She could not have been clearer about that. Remember, if the defendant himself agrees with his displeasure and anger at Harmony when he got rid of her, and it, that it was because of having accidents in the car, and when he says it to other people, that's not a coincidence. That's corroboration. Corroboration that he was angry at Harmony for the bathroom accidents. E evidence that even though this little five-year-old girl that he thought was doing it on purpose, evidence of why he was so angry that morning. What else corroborates Kayla's account of when Harmony was killed and what the defendant did to her? Matt Gendron and Kim Frayne. Both of them corroborate the time of when this occurred. Both of them corroborated because hey, Kayla told you it happened when they were back, excuse me, went to the last night that they had their car going into the morning, the drive from the methadone clinic to Burger King in the morning on December 7th. And after that, they move into Anthony Badero's Audi. And what do we have on that cold, dark winter night December 8, 2019, just after midnight, we've got the defendant Facebook messaging away to Matt Gendron as he told him, hey, need help, ASAP, please, need a jump and jumper cables, ASAP, I need a jump, my car died. We've been sleeping in our car and the battery, I'm sorry, we've been sleeping in our car and the battery just died. My car died. My car, me and we know what car he's staying in, it's Anthony Badero's Blue Audi. We know that from the tow receipt, because the car went and got towed by Aaron Sweeney earlier on on the 7th. Matt didn't want to go out. Kim agreed to go out, got there with a the jumper pack, and when she was there, no Harmony. The two boys get in the car. Harmony doesn't get in the car. More corroboration of when this happened. Separate from Kayla's testimony, separate from the corroboration that what she says is in fact the truth. What is unreasonable to be believed? What is not corroborated? What's not corroborated is the defendant's theory that something happened in the middle of the night while he wasn't there. There has been no evidence of that. I'm going to talk about Mr. Badero for a few more minutes. The defendant proclaimed in opening that the defendant wasn't around, excuse me, that he wasn't around that night because he was doing his business to get them out of that car. He's unemployed. He got no business. What business have we seen or heard any testimony about? He wasn't out working for Anthony Badero, making money and doing his business because Anthony Badero showed us he's not the type of guy who's going to go ahead and hire the defendant to go out and work for him in the middle of the night. Tony Badero is not the type of guy who lets a homeless family stay in his car for more than two days. He was the type of guy who wanted that the family wanted to make sure didn't find out that they were living in Tony Badero's parking lot before their car broke down. And Tony Badero was definitely not the type of guy who was going to trust a homeless drug user who buys drugs from him to drive his car around at the middle of the night to help deliver drugs. Mr. Badero testified that he drove his car back then, despite not having a license. It's not reasonable for you to believe that he is going to have Adam Montgomery drive him around that night, either to deliver drugs or for, in exchange for drugs. <laughs> I mean, heck, remember, Mr. Badero admitted to you that when he met the defendant, it was in the late summer of 2019. When? The one time that he, one time he told you that he had the defendant drive him. And what was he driving to? the courthouse on charges for Mr. Badero getting caught for driving without a license. When you go to the courthouse for charges of driving without a license, probably a good idea if you don't drive your own car. Probably a good idea to have somebody else drive you, which is what Mr. Badero testified to, that that was the one time he had the defendant drive his car. And that's back in the summer, long before the family's homeless long before December of 2019. If the defendant gets pulled over making drug deliveries in the middle of the night, as defense is suggesting you, Mr. badero has got a lot bigger problems to worry about than driving around without a license. Employing the defendant as his driver is something that Mr. Badero denied 
and as you can see from reason, is not something that Mr. Badero would have done. It's not rational. It's also not rational to believe that Mr. Badero would have entrusted the defendant to go out and deliver his drugs for him. From all of the testimony you've heard at that time, you can easily imagine that if Mr. Badero trusted the defendant to go deliver drugs for him, the drugs that got delivered were probably going to be a lot less than what Mr. Demero, De Badero had promised his customers. Common sense tells you that is not true. Common sense tells you that the defendant has no place to be the night of the 6th and the 7th, except in his car, with his family, with Harmony. He has no business. He has nowhere else to be. And why did Mr. Badero tell us all this? He also said that he, the defendant and Kayla, when he saw them, were always together. Always together. And that when he did go outside and see the kids, it was during the course of the relationship. Mr. Badero said, when he, those days, on the out days when they were in the Audi and he went outside, he did not see Harmony. Harmony was not there on the 8th. Harmony was not there on the 9th. And Kayla, as much as got jumbled a few minutes ago in closing arguments, Kayla was clear as well. It's one of the lies that she told you was a lie that the defendant doesn't want you to believe is a lie. She told you in grand jury that she lied and said that, oh, in grand jury, I told Anthony Badero, I, I, I know that Anthony Badero saw the kids in harmony and waved to him every day. I said that in grand jury, and I lied in grand jury. But you just heard in closing arguments that the defendant doesn't want you to believe that that's a lie, even though she admitted that that's a lie. You want to have your cake, and you want to eat it too. That's what the defendant wants. What else is unreasonable to believe? Arguments that, well, no one would have seen him stuffing her, in, stuffing her into the duffel bag when the car was pulled over on the intersection of Webster and Elm. Nobody, nobody, that would have happened, and for nobody to have seen it, that's impossible. It's easy to manipulate 35 pounds in a rear seat of a passenger when your back is to the sidewalk and the shrubs that you saw there on that section of the road with a building with very few windows on that section of the road when it's freezing cold and everyone around you is distracted by the woman who's waving other cars to go around. The physical evidence in the car and the physicality of manipulating Harmony's body show that this is yet another way in which the defendant's theory is unsupported. That his arguments that Harmony died from something other than his hands the morning of December 7th, that is unreasonable. It was he who punished her with his fists that day, and it was he who decided to destroy, alter, conceal, and remove her body from the Sebring to be sure it couldn't be used against him when somebody came asking, where is Harmony? You may, when you're back in deliberations, be looking at the evidence in this case, different pieces of evidence that are there, photographs, diagrams, having a good understanding of where everything was, where it was found. And you may be asking yourself, why don't we have more forensic evidence here? First of all, the defendant is telling you that he falsified physical evidence. The other thing is that, as experts have told you time and time again, each one of the experts that got up here, time and elements can wear down DNA and fingerprints and blood. They were able to find DNA 100 sextillion times, more likely, female child of the defendant and Crystal Sori on this toothbrush in the very back of the trunk, the trunk of the Audi that the defendant, excuse me, of the Sebring that the defendant had abandoned. But by being so good in hiding his crimes and in intimidating the one witness the eyewitness to him beating Harmony to death by wiping down and hiding and destroying evidence, he was sure that there was going to be less and less of it around. And yet still, 
from that toothbrush, from the ceiling, the truth prevailed. Sometimes evidence is not always where you expect to find it. We heard testimony about this cooler, Christina Lubin's cooler, this cooler, that the defendant kept Harmony's body in. We know that Harmony was in there in a bag. We also know from Christina Lubin that she used to put money in there, and she had put money in there recently for the defendant to be able to take to help provide for the family. So we know there should be fingerprints on the inside of that because their fingers definitely would have gone in to take the money. And yet the fingerprints are not there. We know that latent prints sometimes go away. And yet when Kayla Montgomery comes forward and tells you, here is what I know. She finally comes forward in June. She leads everybody. She leads police to the evidence that actually corroborates and in ways that she never could have known. She never would have known what was in the fit seal. She never would have known that police would have been able to find a sample, an example from CMC of the bag that the defendant had stuffed Harmony into. She told you she initially thought with police this was the bag. She never would have known afterwards that Emily Thompson and Cameron Gibney both saw bag in the Portland Pie Cooler. She never would have known about what had happened and was found and was discussed in ch uh, testimony about the Union Street bathroom, the ATM records, the Home Depot receipt, the Econostay Lodge, the rental records. She never would have known that when she came forward with this. in the ceiling, not even my height. Kayla Montgomery is not climbing up there to be able to look and see that there's something still in that ceiling. Part of all of those different things and what happened, you should also go ahead and consider what Kayla said afterwards about the forensic evidence that she could not have known would have corroborated her. You heard about the bag of lime. It's not the fanciest looking bag of lime up there, is it? But that's the one that she identified. So let's talk about that for a moment. It's the bag of lime that has the same skew that had been purchased the day of February 26th. That an 11:20 ATM withdrawal happened at the Citizens Bank, South Willow Street, and. 20 minutes later, 20 minutes later, across the street at the Home Depot, that's when there's a purchase of that bag of lime. That SKU number specifically was found, as was testified to by the gentleman from Home Depot. A purchase of lime by a person who doesn't own a lawn and has nothing to fertilize in the middle of the winter. A common sense tells us Maybe the defendant really wanted to get some lye, L-Y-E, like you would find in Drano, breaks down organic material, rather than lime, to make your soil, uh, doesn't lower the pH, it raises it, makes it less acidic. But the lime purchased at Home Depot 20 minutes after the ATM transaction, and what was it purchased with? A grinder, a blade, that, purchase and a battery, excuse me. That's not a coincidence. Again, that's corroboration. Corroboration that when the defendant talked about how he wanted to get rid of Harmony's body, when they got their tax account, uh, refunds in their account, that's what he did. So when she told you, and we talked about, we heard about this a moment ago in cross-examination, when she told you that she had seen this grinder, new in a box at some point, believing that she had seen it at her mother's house earlier on when the defendant said that was the kind of saw he wanted to use to get rid of Harmony's body. And then when you heard that Christina Lubin doesn't own this kind of saw, it's a grinder. She does woodworking. This is not a woodworking tool. It's for grinding metal. You have to ask yourself, where is it then that Kayla saw this grinder in a box? Where was it? Again, not the lie of a master schemer, is it? 
Why would she concoct that out of thin air, as the defendant's arguing? Why say that that's the graw, sinder, excuse me, saw, grinder or saw that he discussed when she knows and testified to you already that there's a corded saw in a box underneath the sink? If this was untrue, if she had not seen this grinder at some point, new and in a box, if she was singing for her supper, she would have instantly just said, oh, yeah, it's the saw that we have down there. Saw the whole thing. That's what happened. Yeah, detectives, that's the saw. But she didn't do that. She identified the grinder. She said she saw it new. She remembers it because that's what the defendant talked about wanting to use on Harmony. If she didn't see it at Christina Lupin's house, and the only other place you can reasonably conclude is that she saw it at Union Street, along with the bag of lime, and she doesn't remember it clearly. That's the only other reasonable, logical conclusion to make. It's not a coincidence that from their account, the money gets taken out, and 20 minutes later, this happens. It's corroboration. And the next day, the next day, Dennis Cloutier is over at the house. The next day, trying to snake the drain, as asked by the defendant. And who did he say is pacing behind him while he is trying to snake the drain? The drain and the drain cover that's already been off. Is it, no, oh no, it's not Caleb. It's the defendant, he said. <coughs> Just the defendant who is pacing behind him. More evidence that Kayla would never have known corroborates what happened. More and more and more. She could never have known that there would be easy pass toll records of the same rental vehicle going back and forth, as Trooper Hernandez told us, through the Tobin Bridge on the night that he left to get rid of the body with the U-Haul. She could never have known when she told police what happened, that those records were there, and that lo and behold, the odometer perfectly matches up to the distance to take that drive. Common sense tells you that. She didn't know that. She didn't know that that corroboration existed because it's not reasonable to think that Kayla would tell and enable police to find other evidence that she did something. If, you, she, if she was the one that who had killed Harmony, like the defendant wants you to believe, she would never have done any of this. The theory does not fit. And I want to jump to another reason why this theory does not fit. He's shown us that he's not the type of person that would have allowed this to happen under his theory. He's argued to you that he's a caring parent, despite what we've seen from the rest of the evidence. But his theory is, in fact, this, that they had planned for hours what to do with the body, and that the plan was to carry her around for months and store her in different places and then finally do something eventually whenever we get enough money for a grinder. That doesn't make sense. His theory is also that he was such a caring parent that he came home in the middle of the night from taking care of business to discover that his five-year-old that he fought to get custody of is dead while left in Kayla's care, and he just takes it. He doesn't react. He doesn't rage. His theory is that he doesn't hit Kayla or yell or scream so others can hear, is that he just sits in the car for the rest of the day and night and takes it, goes to the methadone clinic at 704 like it's nothing in the morning and takes it. That's his theory. That's not him. That's not who we've seen. That he would show indifference towards Harmony's death that he bags, carts, stores, stuffs, frees, thaws, squishes, consolidates his child. He does all of that, then leaves Kayla for another woman, leaves her with this woman that he's arguing to now, killed one of his children, leaves the other kids with her, and then takes off to Maine, goes on to live his life. That's not him. That's not him. That's not what we've heard. He doesn't do nothing. He would not have been the passenger in this situation. He's the driver. What the defendant suggests his reaction was would not have been his reaction. 
if Harmony just died in the middle of the night from something, and he came back to find her in a duffel bag in the trunk. So we know that theory that depends on you believing that he's type of, that type of person does not work. It is a fantasy. It is beyond belief. It is a bizarro world that the defendant would have you believe in the light of discovering that his offspring is dead, that he does nothing, and that it's Kayla who's always doing the something. That's not reasonable because it's not supported by the evidence, not with the defendant's lies to others, not with the actions that we've seen him take towards Kayla, not with the evidence that he left on Kayla's face and arms and back. And he lied to others, too. He lied to others, too. Who's the one that's getting rid of the phone? He's got his new girlfriend, Kelsey Small, to get rid of the phone. You saw from the other video there, he doesn't put himself in front of the camera. In fact, you probably saw when he first walked in, he had half a hand over his face. The video's there. You can look at it if you'd like when we go back into deliberations. He lied to the tow truck driver about his address. He had to abandon the car. It was the crime scene. He used his, he told the tow truck driver, mm, I live at 77 Guilford Street. We know he doesn't live at 77 Guilford Street. He told the tow truck driver, I got no phone. We know he has a phone. He used it that night to Facebook message Matt Gendron to try to get a jump for the dead car. He lies to get rid of things. He tries to continue to hide. He tells Travis Beach, don't send me this stuff on Facebook. He certainly does have a cell phone during that time. He wants to get his car away from him as fast as possible. What better way to abandon it? Just tell the tow truck driver you don't have the phone and don't worry about it. Let him get rid of the evidence because he's telling you now that he's guilty of getting rid of evidence. The defendant admitted only to what he had to, which to you or I would be unspeakable acts to do to any human being, let alone a small child, let alone your own flesh and blood. He says in his arguments, you should find him guilty of altering, destroying, concealing, and removing Harmony's body. And he admits this, why? Because he thinks you're gonna be fooled his counsel questioned Kayla with the legal principle, and I'm sure you remember it. She was asking Kayla about her petty theft from Dunkin' Donuts. Well, you took some responsibility of it. Um, you took the lesser way out of the problem, so you wouldn't get a more serious charge. That's what he thinks that you're going to let him do. He thinks if you'll let him slide on the murder, if he admits to what happened afterwards because he knows the evidence of that is overwhelming, that you'll let it go on the other two. And he admits what he can't deny. He denies what he can't afford to admit. And the only part of harmony that we have left will be sitting in that deliberation room with you on that pink toothbrush and outside here in this part of the ceiling wall that's there. And the other parts of her body, her rest of her torso, her face, her eyes, that smile, only the defendant as we all sit and stand here today, knows where they are. And he can't afford to admit to you that he knows where they are because the evidence contained on them will show that he caused her death. So she won't get the burial that everyone deserves. She doesn't get a headstone in the ground above the head that he battered. She doesn't get to be at peace in death because of what he did, because he can't afford to tell anyone where she is. She doesn't get dignity. She doesn't get peace because this man did nothing. He didn't, excuse me, didn't do nothing. He did something called murder. And because he says trying to find her is a waste of time. That trying to find her is a waste of taxpayer money. That's what he thinks of her. That's what he thinks of what he did. That's what he thinks of you now efforts to find where he put her and what he did to her and why he killed her, they're a waste of time to him. His words, you heard them, to find the child that he murdered and the evidence that he hid. He believes Harmony's life and death are a waste of time and that they weren't anything to him and that he 
dumped her like trash. This is what you've seen in the evidence. This is what you've heard the defendant say when you consider whether he has an extreme indifference to the value of Harmony's life when he killed her. He had no value for her life when he killed her. He took an innocent life, a child, for no reason other than his rage and his indifference and his ignorance and his lack of humanity. Because this trial is about Harmony Montgomery. And you sat here and you were so attentive to every moment, every terrible fact. You watch the eyes and the voices of every witness and you know it's not about quantity, it's about quality. How they testified, how they looked at you when they answered questions on cross and direct. That was not a waste of time. Only Harmony's killer would say that finding her is a waste of time. That's bearing witness is what you have done to the truth. And that's a front row seat on what this man perpetrated on Harmony and her body and the truth from being shown to you, who cowardly runs off to Maine to distance himself from the scene of his crimes who runs with Demetrios, comes to the house and could see that bruise on her face. And even then, a week later, Demetrios still saw marks of her after the defender had bashed her all around the house. The man who complains about tracking down leads in Arizona as a waste of effort to prove something. Yes, that's what people do. That's what this community, this state, this nation, this society do. We go to find and protect life. Every one of us, whether you wear a badge or you don't, you seek to protect children, to put the next generation above your own. That's what a father does. That's not what the defendant wanted because he is not Harmony's father. He has forfeited that right to even claim that title or call himself her father. She was never a daughter to him. Not in July, not in December, not in that phone call, not from the moment of her death continuing up through this very day when he knows where she is. He killed somebody he didn't see as a daughter. He never saw her as a blessing. He beat down something he saw as a nuisance, that he saw as an inconvenience his behavior to the bathroom accidents shows you that in that moment when he killed her, she wasn't a person, she was an object, a thing. And he was mad at this thing that ruined his car and he hit and he hit and he hit this thing to make it stop doing what he didn't want it to do, to teach it a lesson until he said to Kayla, I think I heard her this time. I think I did something. And he might as well have said, I think I broke it. And that's what he did to her. Afterwards, only proves that his actions don't believe that he murdered his daughter. He broke one of his things. And like any broken thing that somebody never really loved, they throw it away, and that's what he did. He may have genetically donated half of his DNA to her, but he was not her father. She was an object that he beat, stuffed, threw, and shelved in a walk-in cooler. Cameron Gibney told you she was down next to the mustard. She was an object made even tinier from her 35 pounds when she was alive by defrosting and consolidating her down that he took to a hotel and he drove through some tolls and he threw it away. And he knows where she is right now, but he believes it's a waste of time and taxpayer money to try to find her. So don't you ever think that this man murdered his own daughter. Rebecca Maines told you he 
hated Harmony because she reminds him of her mother. Defense counsel sold you don't to go ahead and put a motion aside and look at the facts. Look at the facts. Look at the facts and call him a killer. Put a motion aside, look at the facts, and then you can call him a tyrant. And you can call him a rageful, call him rageful. Those descriptions, descriptions suggested to you, maybe, evil. But don't call him a father. It's time now for you to hear the court's final instructions, to then go back into that room and deliberate all the evidence that you've seen, and to hold the defendant responsible for everything he did in July of 2019, in December of 2019, and afterwards. You promised both parties in the court during jury selection that when proof had been shown beyond a reasonable doubt of all of the elements of the crimes that you could and would hold the defendant responsible. And now, not all doubt, but all reasonable doubt. And that proof has been shown. You promised us during jury selection that you did that, and you would do that, and you saw Kayla testify. From that alone, you've got sufficient evidence to convict him of every charge, but you don't have to take her word for it because we've just talked about and you've seen for two weeks all of the evidence that corroborates and gives you what you need to find him guilty on each and every single one of these charges. We saw in this Kayla courtroom that Kayla is not lying about who hit Harmony. And there is no doubt about how Harmony was hurt in July, who killed her in December, what was done to her body and who did it, who falsified physical evidence, and how the defendant kept Kayla quiet. He's guilty of second degree murder for recklessly causing Harmony's death with extreme indifference to the value of his life because you've seen beyond even that standard, he had complete indifference to the value of her your life. Kayla did nothing. He did a lot of things. He did something, he said. It's called murder. It's called assault. And he's guilty of every single one of those charges in front of you. And so I ask you, to hold him responsible for that truth in what you've seen in the facts, what you've seen, what you've tested, and what you've heard has been proven. Find him accountable and find him guilty on every single one of these charges. And I thank you so much for your time today. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm now gonna give you my final instructions. As I said to you earlier, you will have, uh, I'll send 12 sets of all the instructions, both the ones that I gave to you prior to opening statements and the ones I give to you now as a whole. You will have copies of, written copies of these instructions with you in the jury deliberation room, so please listen carefully. Please remember that in order to reach a verdict in this case, whether it is guilty or not guilty, your verdict must be unanimous. Prior inconsistent statements. In deciding whether to believe a witness, you may consider whether the witness made statements before trial which were not consistent with the witness's testimony at trial. Thus, if the witness made an inconsistent statement before trial, you may use that statement in deciding whether to believe that witness's trial testimony. Keep in mind that you may not use the statement made before trial as proof that the facts in this statement are true. The statement made before trial is only to be used by you in deciding whether to believe a witness. There are, however, two exceptions to this general rule that prior statements may only be used in assessing witness credibility. If the statement made before trial was made by the defendant or by a witness under oath, then you may use that prior statement as proof that the facts in the statement are true. I'm now going to discuss the definition of a crime and the crimes with which the defendant is charged. The definition of a crime. A crime is the breaking of a law for which the law provides punishment. All crimes have at least two parts, an act and a criminal state of mind. 
In deciding whether a person is guilty of a crime, you must determine both what the person's actions were and what his state of mind was. For a person to be guilty of a crime, he must have physically acted to do something that is criminal, and he must have had a particular state of mind. Unless a person both acted to do something that is criminal and had the required mental state, that person has not committed a crime. That means that if a person either did not physically act to do something criminal or did not have the required mental state, then he is not guilty of a crime. To understand how mental state works, consider this example. Suppose two automobile drivers hit a pedestrian who was crossing the street. Suppose one of the drivers hit the pedestrian deliberately, whereas the other one did so out of carelessness. The two drivers would be of different crimes even though they both committed the same act because each had a different mental state. Proof of intent. To prove that the defendant has committed a crime, the state must first prove that the defendant did certain acts and second that the defendant acted with a certain intent. Whether the defendant acted with the particular in intent charged is a question of fact for you to decide. Keep in mind that there is often no direct evidence of intent because there is no way of examining the operation of a person's mind. You should consider all of the facts and circumstances in evidence in deciding whether or not the state has proven that the defendant acted with the intent as it is charged in the indictment. Multiple indictments, one defendant. Each of the indictments against the defendant constitutes a separate offense. You must consider each indictment separately and determine whether the state has proven the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The fact that you may find the defendant guilty or not guilty on one of the indictments should not influence your verdict with respect to the other indictments. The charged offenses. Charge ID 1937947C. The defendant is charged with the crime of second degree assault. The definition of this crime has three parts or elements. The state must prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove that one, the defendant caused bodily injury to Harmony Montgomery, and two, Harmony Montgomery was a child under the age of 13, and three, the defendant acted knowingly. Certain words in the definition need to be further defined. Knowingly. A person acts knowingly when he is aware of the nature of his conduct or the circumstances under which he acted. The state does not have to prove that the defendant specifically intended or desired a particular result. What the state must prove is that the defendant was aware of the nature of his conduct. Charge ID 2027112C, the defendant is charged with the crime of second degree murder recklessly with extreme indifference to the value of human life. The definition of this crime has three parts or elements. The state must prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove that one, the defendant caused the death of Harmony Montgomery, and two, Harmony Montgomery was under the age of 13, and three, the defendant acted recklessly under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to the value of human life. These are the elements of the crime of sec second degree murder, recklessly with extreme indifference to the value of human life. Certain words in the definition need to be further defined. Recklessly. A person acts recklessly when he is aware of and consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that his conduct would cause a certain result. The risk must be of such a nature and degree that considering the circumstances known to him, its disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the conduct that a law-abiding person would observe in the situation. There are several components of a reckless mental state that the state must prove. One, the defendant was aware of a substantial and unjustifiable risk that his conduct would cause a particular result. And two, the defendant consciously disregarded the risk. In other words, he elected to disregard the risk and take the chance that his conduct would cause a particular result. 
It is not enough for the state to prove that the defendant failed to become aware of the risk involved. The state must prove that the defendant was aware of the risk and consciously disregarded it. And three, from what the defendant knew of the circumstances, his disregard of the risk was a gross deviation from what a law-abiding person would have done under the circumstances. The key words here are gross deviation. If you find that the defendant's actions were unreasonable or thoughtless, that is not enough. To find that the defendant acted recklessly, you must find that his disregard of the risk was a substantial departure from what a law-abiding person would have done under the same circumstances. For a killing to be second-degree murder, the defendant must not simply act recklessly, but rather must act recklessly under circumstances showing an extreme indifference to the value of human life. This means something more than merely being aware of and consciously disregarding a substantial and unjustifiable risk of death. The risk involved and the disregard must be so blatant as to manifest extreme indifference to the value of human life. Charge ID 2027113C, falsifying physical evidence. The defendant is charged with the crime of falsifying physical evidence. The definition of this crime has three parts or elements. The state must prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove that one, the defendant believed that an official proceeding or investigation was pending or about to be instituted. And two, the defendant altered, destroyed, concealed, or removed the body of Harmony Montgomery. And three, the defendant's purpose in committing that act was to impair the verity or availability of the physical evidence in the proceeding or investigation. Certain words in the definition need to be further defined. Official proceeding means any proceeding before a legislative, judicial, administrative, or other governmental body or official authorized by law to take evidence under oath or affirmation, including a notary or other person taking evidence in connection with any such proceeding. The term purposely. A person acts purposely when his conscious object is to engage in certain conduct. The state must prove that the defendant had the conscious object to engage in this conduct. The key words here are conscious object. To have a conscious object means to have a specific intent. It means that the defendant desired to engage in certain conduct. It is not enough for the state to prove that the defendant knew or was aware of what he was doing, nor is it enough for the state to prove that the defendant created a risk of injury or harm. To prove that the defendant acted purposely requires more than that. It requires proof that the defendant specifically intended or desired to do a particular act. Charge ID 2027114C, abuse of corpse. The defendant is charged with the crime of abuse of corpse. The definition of this crime has three parts or elements. The state must prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove one, the defendant removed, concealed, or destroyed the corpse of Harmony Montgomery or any part thereof. Two, the defendant acted unlawfully. And three, the defendant acted knowingly. These are the elements of the crime of abuse of corpse. Certain words in the definition need to be further defined. That word is knowingly. I've already read you the definition. Uh, I, in the instructions, I just refer you back to the definition that I gave you of knowingly. So it's the same definition that applies here. Charge ID 2027115C, tampering with witnesses and informants. The defendant is charged with the crime of tampering with witnesses and informants. The definition of this crime has three parts or elements. The state must prove each element beyond a reasonable doubt. Thus, the state must prove that the defendant believed that an official investigation was pending or was about to be instituted, and two, the defendant attempted to induce or otherwise cause Kayla Montgomery to testify or inform falsely, and three, the defendant acted purposely. The definition of purposely for purposes of this charge is the same as the definition of purposely that I 
have already read to you. I won't read it again, but you'll note that that definition is above. It is the same definition that applies to this charge. Those are the crimes that are pending against the defendant and are before you. The defendant's absence at trial. The, de the defendant has been absent from trial. His absence from trial is not evidence in the case. You are not to guess or speculate as to the reason for his absence, and you may not draw any negative or adverse inference as a result of his not being present. You are not to consider for any purpose or in any manner in arriving at your verdict the fact that the defendant was not present at trial. That fact should not enter into your deliberations or discussions in any manner at any time. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, let me say that this case is important to both of the parties, the state and the defendant. The principles of law that I have given to you are intended to guide you in reaching a fair result. You are to exercise your judgment and common sense with honesty, understanding, and due deliberation. As I said before, you should decide this case without passion, without prejudice, and without sympathy. It is your highest duty as officers of this court to conscientiously determine a fair and just result in this case. Now again, as you were instructed during the general selection process, there is a presumption of innocence that applies and continues throughout the trial until the state convinces you beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty of each and every element of the offenses with which he has been charged and the defendant has no obligation whatsoever to prove his innocence in this matter, and that includes the right not to testify if he so chooses. When you have considered and weighed all of the evidence, you must make one of the following findings with respect to the charges before you. If you have a reasonable doubt as to whether the state has proved any one or more of the elements of the offense charged, you must find the defendant not guilty. On the other hand, if you find that the state has proved all of the elements of the offense charged beyond a reasonable doubt, then you should find the defendant guilty. And I remind you that a reasonable doubt is just what the words would ordinarily imply. The use of the word reasonable means simply that the doubt must be reasonable rather than unreasonable. It must be a doubt based upon reason. It is not a frivolous or fanciful doubt, nor is it one that can easily be explained away. Rather, it is a doubt based upon reason as remains after consideration of all of the evidence that the state has offered against it. As I mentioned, we will select a foreperson at random at the end of these instructions. The foreperson acts much like the chair of a committee. He or she should make sure that you take up the issues that I have described and should make sure that each juror has a full opportunity to present his or her opinions and arguments. I suggest that deliberations involve several components. You should each think for yourself about the evidence and the law. You should speak up and let your fellow jurors know your opinions, views, and positions. You should listen carefully and keep an open mind as to what your fellow jurors have to say and you should make every reasonable effort to reach a unanimous agreement. The verdict that you reach must be a unanimous verdict and represent the considered judgment of each juror. In order to return a verdict, all 12 of you must agree on your verdict. As you deliberate, try your best to work out your differences. Do not hesitate to change your mind if you are convinced that the other jurors are right and that your original position was wrong. But do not change your mind just because other jurors see things differently or just to get the case over with. In the end, your vote must be exactly that, your own vote. It is important for you to reach unanimous agreement, but only if you can do so honestly and in good conscience. If any questions concerning the law should arise during your deliberations, the four person should write the question out and sign and hand it to the court officer. The court officer will bring that to me and I will respond. You should take as much time as you like. You will be given a verdict form to complete. When you have arrived at a verdict, let the court officer know and you will be returned to the courtroom where the foreperson will render the verdict orally in response to questions that the clerk of court will ask. 
The jury foreperson may use the jury verdict form in answering the clerk's questions as to each charge. So ladies and gentlemen, I am going to send back one jury verdict form that has each of the charges and a place where you can record uh, what your verdict is. And that document can stay with the jury foreperson when you are brought back into the courtroom uh, and our, the jury foreperson will use that to respond to the clerk's questions. Please bear in mind, in your deliberations, there can be no communications with anyone other than the other deliberating jurors in the case or the bailiff. You are not to use your cell phones or smartphones to communicate with anyone, check email, or use the internet. Your verdict in this case must be based solely on the evidence presented at trial and the law as I have explained it to you. We will now select the alternates and the jury foreperson. So the first alternate will be juror number nine. So juror number nine will be our first alternate. Second alternate, juror number four. The third alternate, juror number five. The fourth alternate, juror number one. And finally, Fifth alternate will be juror number 15. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm now going to pick the jury four person. Juror number two. Are you willing to serve as the four person? Yes? Okay, very good. Um, all right, um, let me just say the alternates, those of you who are selected as alternates will be taken to a separate location. You are not to discuss the case. You are not to read anything about the case. You are not to uh, look at any media, do any research. All the same rules that uh, applied before still apply to you now. There are times when we do need to use uh, one or more alternates for purposes of deliberations, so it is critically important that you're not discussing the case with each other or with anybody else. Uh, you're not to do any independent research. Um, don't look anybody up. You uh, are under sort of the same obligations as you were before um, in the event that we need to use you uh, for purposes of deliberations. We need to make sure that you haven't discussed the case with anybody or done any independent research. Uh, let me say for the, for the deliberating jurors, we're going to send you back into the deliberation room. You may begin your deliberations whenever you are ready. Uh, the exhibits, I explained to you before that the exhibits will go back into the deliberation room. Um, so all of the exhibits with the exception of just a few. We are not going to send back, um, we are not going to send back, there was one body-worn camera video. If you wish to see the bo that body-worn camera video, what we would do is um, let the court officer know. We would bring you back in and we could show it to you at that time. Uh, we're also not going to send back some of the larger, the sheetrock, uh, the rails, and the cooler, okay? But if you are interested in seeing any of those exhibits, please just let the court officer know and we'll bring you back into the courtroom and you'll be able to view those exhibits if you wish to do so. So the sheetrock, the rails, the cooler are not going to go back into the deliberation room. Uh, the body worn camera that you, that you viewed while you were here, that's also not going to go back. But if you wish to view any of those things, uh, please just let the court officer know. We'll bring you back in and we'll do it at that time. All right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think uh, we have accomplished everything out here that we need to accomplish. You've been very, very attentive. I, uh, I very much appreciate that. Uh, I'm gonna, now going to let the court officers take the, the alternates to their location and the jury uh, to the deliberation, the deliberating jurors to the deliberation room. All rise for the jurors, please.
You may be seated. <laughs> 